Let's turn to God's Word. And we're looking at Isaiah. And one verse in Isaiah this morning, along with a whole variety of verses through Scripture. And if you want a copy of these, I can always email the Scripture verses to you. Just ask, please. But we're looking at the theme this morning. I am with you. And uh, as we were thinking about the text for the year with the deacons and others, this verse actually came through and we believe it's the right verse for this year for us as a fellowship together. So let's see what God has to say to us this morning. So Isaiah writes, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Uphold you with my sword arm, if you like. The indication of when it mentions right hand in the Bible, very often it's indicative of that. And within many cultures, it is the strong weapon hand that protects and sees us through in times of trouble, war, and strife. And so God promises us in his word that we're not to fear because he is with us. We're not to be dismayed for he is our God. And he will strengthen us and help us as we cry out to him this morning. And that's our theme, that's our text for the year for 2009. And it's interesting that I was reading quite a few articles over the Christmas period and before then that this passage of Scripture came up quite a few times in different articles. It's something that God's saying to the church at this time. Isaiah, around 760 BC, wrote much of the incarnational foretelling messages as we saw over the Christmas period during Advent season. Prophetic words from God. And this side of the new covenant, it is for God's people in this generation as well. The promises of God are still here for us. Reformation Scotland did some research and found, according to the U version of the Bible app, Isaiah 41 in verse 10 was the most shared, bookmarked, and highlighted text of any other text in 2018. And perhaps that's an indication of where we're at as a nation. So many people are concerned. So many people are worried. So many people are looking out on the blackness of humanity and are looking for words of hope, encouragement, and being built up with a message that's going to see them through. And what better message than this passage of Scripture? Apparently, 18 million searches by individuals were as a result of looking to see what the Bible had to say on that particular site in their emotional highs and lows of life. Now, that one app, that's not including all the other Bible apps. So this is for your encouragement. Some say that the Bible has no significance today. But that one app was used 350 million devices worldwide. It was used on 350 million devices worldwide. Don't ask me how they work it out. I haven't a clue. Ask Robert, he'll maybe be able to tell you. But the Word of God is still here for us today. People are still hankering after God, despite the powers that be, seeking to move Christianity from public life in flavor of a, a, a more fluid society. They want to flavor our society with their own ideals. And of course, that brings little restraint. It brings little message of certainty for anything. Anything goes. The old absolutes, God is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, no longer apply as far as many in our higher echelons of authority are concerned. There's no certainty of hope or promise for the future. Never mind the present. And sadly, even Christian churches have brought this in worldly view and practice into their midst with their teachings. The Bible no longer is absolute. The Bible is no longer 
the thing that we go to to find God's will and purpose. No longer is it the very breath of God, if you like. No longer is it the teaching of God, because you can take and interpret according to yourself. No longer is the teachings of Christ in the power of the Spirit acceptable publicly in the public arena, in the public high street. And so we have a pick and mix version of faith, the mixed match, the contamination, and it's toxic and it's dangerous, it's lethal to true spiritual growth and health and well-being. But for those who believe and those who trust in God's Word, this year will be a year where as we seek God's face and seek His Word as believers, we can take the assurances and the certainties of God's Word to others to enable them to understand and find a hope and a promise that is sure, steadfast, and certain. And the assurances and the promises of God's Word become faithful in our lives and develop in our lives and grow in our lives because God never lies. He's not corrupted. He's supreme. He's steadfast. He's certain. He's never changing. He was before this world and time began. He will be after time will be no more. And we can trust in his unfailing love. Paul writes to the Corinthians in, he, in the second letter, in chapter 1 and verse 20, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so the amen is spoken to the glory of God. Real words of encouragement. He follows on to say, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anoints us, sets his seal of ownership on us, puts his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing for what is to come. God is faithful. God's honorable. God's just. And we see this none more so than when he sends his Son from glory, the glory of heaven, to be born of a virgin, laid in a manger, placed in an animal feed salt for shelter as the perfect fulfillment of promise. We saw that right through the Advent season. You see, sadly, most Christians find it simple to accept the babe in the manger as the promised one and love the, the nice fluffy feeling of Christmas, the nice simple Christmas message. But when it comes to trusting the risen Christ, it's a different matter. The one who is full of authority, the victor, the supreme, the advocate, that's different. You see, when coal mines were at their height in Fife, thousands and thousands of men, mainly men, worked in the bowels of the earth. Hundreds and sometimes well over a thousand feet below the earth. Just think about that for a minute. And when the mine engineers and surveyors found a seam of great value, it was seen to be a promise fulfilled. A promise fulfilled. And of course, it was fulfilled by those who toiled to get the black diamond out of the ground. And they saw it as God's gift, a precious gift. And the precious gift, albeit brought to the surface by sheer hard work, gave a weekly living to put food on the table for some, just, and yet for others, great wealth, albeit just a few. You see, to attain the precious gift was not without pain and it wasn't without cost. The injuries and loss of life were common along with the poverty for families left behind. But communities continued despite all the challenges. And for some, they managed the challenge with alcohol abuse. For many others, the challenge was met and faced with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The presence of Jesus alongside the pick and the shovel made all the difference. It was Paul that said in Romans 8 and 31 and 32, If God be for us, then who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? 
So quoted an elderly lady who had lost her husband in a pit accident many years before the time when I was working in her house as an apprentice joiner. She had very little in terms of material things in her house, but she was very rich in faith. I didn't understand it at the time, but she was very rich in faith. And she trusted in the Lord Jesus. And as we talked and conversed, as I worked away in her house, she says, who else would I go to for anything? And that challenged me as I worked in her house. And the stirring challenge continued on up to the point where I committed my life to Christ the following year. It was as though God was preparing the pathway for me to come to faith. And here was a woman who had lost everything, had nothing, and yet was rich in the presence of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I am with you, says Isaiah. Speaks into the nation a rich, rich promise that goes on and on and on and on and goes on forever. And I wonder what difference does the presence of God make in our life circumstances? What difference is faith in Jesus going to make in 2019 in our life circumstances? Well, we know that God never breaks His word. He never breaks a promise. Ephesians 3 and 8, Paul says, Although I am the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of of Christ. Wow. I mean, there's a, a sermon on its own. Second Peter 1 and 2. Though he has given us of his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, the promises of God being fulfilled in our lives. And the giver is precious because it's God's character, God's very being that's poured out upon God's people, <coughs> poured out upon you and me. Will he not give us good gifts to his children when we ask? What a promise. Romans 1 and 2, the gospel he promised beforehand through his promise, prophets in the scriptures. We're seeing one of them this morning and many more. Second Timothy, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Titus 1 and 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. God is in control, and He is with us. And that's our promise for this year, and the time ahead until the Lord decides time will be no more. And we need to work while it is still yet day, <laughs> stepping out in faith, walking in faith, living in faith, and being an embodiment of faith that others can see. 1 Peter 1 and, 9, uh, 1 and verse 19 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, the eternal one, sin for all sacrifice, comes forth. And that's the reason that we can live by faith alone, with the assurance of God's presence, because Jesus gave himself in our stead on the cross at Calvary. And the promises in Scripture today we can cling on to and hold on to in the power of God's Spirit because they bring forth God's purposes from our lives. And we can stand and still be standing when he calls us home or when he comes again. 2 Peter 2 and 2, 3 and 4 says, Though these things he's given us, his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by the presence of evil desires. I wonder if we've ever looked into the scriptures in depth and patience to see the promises God makes to his own, not for ours to demand or claim as our right, as some folks would do, in error. But rather, knowing the promises of God, we come to know God's character 
and his personhood more deeply. And we're drawn into that relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that leads us to live as Christ would live. And our relationship with him goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And the deeper we go, the deeper the change in you and me. Remember David, the golden king of Israel? He cries out in the Psalms, Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I wonder if God's word is a joy to us or is it a burden to us? Is it a burden to spend time in God's Word? Is it a burden to read God's Word? Is it a burden to learn of God's Word? Or is it a joy? It's only in relationship that we grow in joy and truth. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And that joy only comes as we spend time in savoring God's truths and God's promises. Earlier, he declares in the psalm in verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then in verse 50, he says, My comfort in suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. Claiming the promises does not preserve our life. I have my right in God, you must do it. But God sees us through everything that we'll ever face in life. He will see us through, no matter what comes along the way. Living in Christ, in relationship with Christ, draws us to a place where the promises become yes in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians, of course, reminds us of that. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ, and so the amen is spoken to the glory of God, as we've heard already. Do we believe that this morning? The amen, the so be it. Not my be it, my will be it, but God's will be it. The so be it, the amen. And that's why we say amen at the end of our prayers. When some folks maybe in the middle of the sermon will cry out, amen, so be it. In other words, God's will, God's will be done. God's purpose, God's plan, God's sovereignty, God's reality. And let's never, ever dare to corrupt God's plan and purpose, but rather in humble submission, surrender to our Lord. So all we are and all we can be is under His control. He is the one who changes our hearts and our minds to his way of thinking and being. We need to be being in Christ, continuing in Christ. That's God's promise to us. If we continue with him, he will continue with us. Are we going to plunge to the depths? Are we going to plunge to the depths? and find more of the reality of God in 2019. If God's been speaking to you for this year, then we need to listen and hear together. We'll be having a church meeting at the end of the month, and we'll be having a time where we share together. We need to hear what God's saying. Saying to us individually, saying to us corporately. We need to hear and learn the mind of Christ together. Remember Joshua 5 and 6 in verse chapter 1? No one will ever be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Be strong and courageous. You'll lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to your ancestors to give them. And you know, the promises of God come down the alleyways of time. And I believe God can give us the land again in this area. The land that's been stolen. Stolen by the world and stolen by the powers of this age. I believe God can restore the land. And restore the land and the years the locusts have eaten. Humanly speaking, all the church writers and all the rest of it will tell us it's impossible. 
And it is. Of course it is. Totally impossible. But what's impossible for us is always possible with God. And in the same unity and purpose, the land was given to God's people back in the days of Joshua. The land can be given back to God's people in 2019. You know, in Hebrews 13 and verses 1 to 6, we hear these words. And this is a word for God's people together. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have continued and shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For the Lord will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And I suppose if you wanted to sum it up, it's like pondering promises in prayer. Pondering promises in prayer. Remember David's prayer in 2 Samuel in verse, um, chapter 7 and verses 27 to 29. Lord Almighty, God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant, saying, I will build a house for you, so your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. Sovereign Lord, you are God. Your covenant is trustworthy. You have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever in your sight for you. Sovereign Lord, you have spoken, and with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. And of course, we know that David, back in the Old, day, the Old Testament days, was the golden age of Israel. And from that reign, despite his subsequent fall from God and restoration, his son takes over the mantle and continues the blessing on, pondering promises and prayer. Brings forth grace when God is with us. Not just little drips of grace, but pouring out like a gushing tap. Isaiah 44 and 3 and 4 says, For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and the streams of dry, streams of dry ground. And on the streams of dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in the meadow, like poplar trees by the flowing streams. Such is God's promises when we ponder on these words and make them our own. Pondering promises and prayer. And Isaiah 58 and 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Well, it doesn't sound like Scotland, though. We had a good summer last year. But he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden. Sounds more like Scotland now. Like a spring whose waters never fail. Pondering promises, prayer. And Paul, when he wrote to the Romans in chapter 8 in verses 35 to 39, declares, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble do it? Or hardship, or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We're considered sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, angels, or demons... Neither the present nor the future or powers, either height or depth or anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? That's something to say amen to. Definitely. Pondering, promise, and prayer. It's God's message to us that as we savor His goodness, Savor his presence. Listen to his still small voice. Listen to the promises and make them our own. Our faith grows in the power of the Spirit. And we move on with God. And the overwhelming call is to us individually 
and corporately. I am with you. And you may feel this morning that you're not worthy for God to be with you. Well, no one ever, ever said you had to be worthy. You had to be submissive and bow the knee and say, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Walk with me. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Help me, Lord. Make me new. Here am I, Lord. Use me. And the Lord says, I am with you. I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. You know, I wonder how we feel this morning. Are we in the the black mode that seems to be current in January? Or are we people of promise? Because as we are people of promise, we are the takers of the promises of God to those who are in darkness because we bring light into the darkness. And you know the wonderful thing? The darkness will never, ever extinguish it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word because we know that your word becomes yes in Christ Jesus. And so we trust in your everlasting love and word. And we know, Father, that you hold us in the palm of your hand. And Father, this morning, continue to speak to us. Speak into the very depths of our being. Help us to ponder and to pray and to experience your promises afresh. Make us new. And give us a promise for the future. That as we walk into the future with you together, we know that you hold the future in your hands. So, Father God, let your will be done in our lives and in our fellowship in accordance with your purpose. To your glory, to your honor, and to your praise. For truly, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.